Marco Codes. Hi, Marco here. In this episode, we're going to build a terminal-based text viewer that we can later on turn into a full-blown text editor. What does that mean? Well, we're going to start with nothing, with almost nothing, just an empty Java skeleton file. And we're going to end up with this, where you can open up text files, you can scroll through them, you can page through them, you can move your cursor around, the cursor wraps around lines, you have a status bar that shows you information. So essentially, we're kind of cloning the less command line tool. As you already saw, we're going to do it with Java, or Java, like some of my ex-colleagues from Sweden used to say. Why Java? Well, because we can, and because this episode is a shout out to all of my enterprise programmers who are mostly shuffling data from A to B, and I want to show them what cool stuff you can effectively build with Java. Sounds good? Let's go. A tiny note before we start. What we're going to build in this episode is only going to work on Unix-based systems, so you're going to be fine with Linux, with macOS, or even WSL and Windows, like I'm using Ubuntu and Windows actually for this project. But we'll have to add native Windows support in one of the future episodes. So imagine we have a very simple Java program like this here, a class called viewer with a main method printing out hello world to the console. When we now run this class from the command line, you can see, surprise, surprise, Hello World was printed out in black and white. Question is, how could we make the text red, for example? And the escape codes to the rescue. Let me show you something. I'm gonna comment out the Hello World line here. I'm gonna paste in a slightly different looking line. Well, we still have our Hello World here, but we start the line with 033, the character, which is the escape character. Open square brackets, 31M, and the same thing here at the end, almost just instead of 31, a zero. Let's rerun our program, and our text is red. Magic! Well, before I'm going to tell you how this works, let me add a 4 and a 44 and a semicolon, rerun our program again, and now the text looks super funky. Red text, blue background, and red underlined. Well, how do those escape codes work? To understand that, let's go to Wikipedia's ANSI escape code page. And like most pages on programming topics on Wikipedia, I find the page rather unhelpful. Let's call it densely written. But no worries, I'm going to help you through it. When you scroll down and go to a section called CSI sequences, you'll find a table. CSI followed by a number, followed by a letter, does something. What does CSI stand for? Well, when you scroll up again a bit, you can see that CSI stands for the escape character 033 and open square brackets, just like what we printed out to the console a second ago. Which means escape character, open square brackets, plus a number, plus an uppercase A moves the cursor up a given amount of cells, well, N cells. Same thing with escape, square brackets, number, uppercase B moves the cursor down. Then you can see, well, cursor position, erase and display. Let's scroll down a bit more because here we go. CSI, escape, square brackets, plus N, the number, plus a lowercase m selects the graphic rendition. What is a graphic rendition? Well, it sets the colors and the style of the characters following this code. Aha. Right, so let's click it. Keeping in mind that we had 4, 44, 31, right? 4 stands for underline. 31 stands for the foreground color. 30 till 37 stands for foreground color. And the 44 sets the background color. When I click color, tons of tables here on this page, you can see that 31 sets the foreground color to red and 44 sets the background color to blue. And hence, all our code here does essentially is we have an escape sequence here and everything that follows the escape sequence, like our Hello World, right, will be printed out with this funky color. And afterwards, the 0M resets all the attributes. So if we just put another text here, hello, hello, for example, rerun our program, you would see, well, Hello World, funky color, and then the hello just in black and white again. Pretty cool. Now let's try something else. Let's have another line here. And instead of the whole thing, we're just going to go 033 open square brackets 2J. Let's see what that does. 
In fact, what 2J does is it deletes the, the screen, right? Hence, we just printed out our text, but you can't see it here because afterwards we just, you know, cleared the screen. Now, one more thing. Let's try, for example, 5H, rerun our program. And, well, we print Hello World to the console. It gets deleted with the rest of the screen. And 5H actually moves our cursor to one, two, three, four, five, the fifth row, right? There's some text wrapping here. But we could also move our cursor not just by rows, but also by columns, which we'll do later on in the video. Now, what you need to take away from this bit is, essentially, when we build our text viewer slash text editor, we're not, you know, gonna call a fancy API to move the cursor around to make some text red. Instead, we're gonna print out the plain text to system out, and we have to make sure to print out the correct NZ escape codes before our text, after our text, to move the cursor around, to style our text, to do everything that we want to do later on. That's the first big main concept to understand. Before we start writing our text viewer, we have yet another problem to solve. The problem being that our terminal by default is in canonical slash cooked mode. What does that mean? Well, I changed our program, so I added a while true loop, so our program runs indefinitely. And what I'm doing essentially is that I want for every key press that the user does on the keyboard, I immediately want to get the key and I want to print out the key, including its ASCII code. Now, when I run my program, I can see that, you know, I can start typing away here, but in fact, I don't see any ASCII codes being printed out. Only when I hit enter, I can see that now it looks like my program received the line up here and it prints out ASDF, GH, including the ASCII codes. Canonical slash cook mode means exactly that. My terminal will echo stuff. It will just send stuff line by line to my program, not key by key. And a couple of other things. For example, when I, you know, press the arrow keys here on my keyboard, I get this funky output. I don't want all of that. I want my terminal to be in raw mode. So we have to set our terminal into raw mode. How do we do that? By calling native functions of the operating system. Don't freak out. It's almost like sending SQL queries to a database. Let's check out how it works. All right, so I know there's a set of functions you can call to interact with a terminal to set it into raw mode slash canonical mode. It's called the term iOS API. How do I know that? Well, you could either read a Unix handbook, a Unix programming handbook, or Google slash Stack Overflow for how do I put my terminal into raw mode slash canonical mode, and you'd end up with the name term iOS. Now, when I open up the MAM page, I can see there's plenty of functions defined in here. You can actually see there's plenty of pages. I'm gonna make it real simple for you. I want you to focus on two functions the get attribute function and the set attribute function. I'm just going to copy that to my clipboard, go back into my, to my program, and I'm just going to put these two functions inside my Java class and comment them out. The question is, how would I call these two functions? You need a library. It's called the JNA library, Java native access library. For that, as we're not using Maven, Gradle, anything like that, just the Java class, Go to the GitHub page, Java Native Accesses to Repository, JNA, scroll down a tiny bit, and you'll find a download link right here. You want to take that jar file, put it into the same folder your Java class lives in, and then come back again and continue watching. All right, so I put the jar file in here. When you're using an IDE like in IntelliJ, also make sure to add the jar file as a library, or else you won't be able to reference any of its classes. And then I can show you how to work with JNA. You want to write an interface. I'm going to call it libc. It doesn't matter what the interface is called. It's just that we're calling shared C functions from your operating system. So libc makes sense. And then the interface needs to extend another interface, a JNA specific interface. Then I'm going to take those two functions and I'm just simply going to copy them in here, right? It almost compiles. You can see get attribute has a file descriptor parameter. We're going to worry about that later. And it needs a struct, a term iOS struct. What's the struct? Well, essentially, it's a Java object without any methods to make it real simple. We don't have such a class yet. So we're just going to create it ourselves, change the method 
down here as well. So I'm just going to write class term iOS. I know that structs need to extend a special JNA class structure uh, again, right? Like so. But that's all we need to do. The question now is what field does that term iOS structure actually have? Well, let's go back to the man page. Back in the man page, let's scroll down a tiny bit and then somewhere you can see, hey, here's the term iOS structure. There's a couple of lines here. So again, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna copy them to my clipboard, go back into my program and paste them in here. I have a couple of fields here. So I have some input modes, some output modes, some control modes. Problem is I also seem to have a TC flag type. I don't know what that is. Is that an int? Is that a byte? Is that a, what is that essentially? Let me show you once how you find that out and then what else you need to do to find out what NCCS stands for, CC underscore T stands for. And you might have guessed correctly. Let's go back to the command line. What you want to do is you want to do a grep, a recursive grep, and then search for TC flag T. You want to search inside user include. That's where all the C header files live with all these, hopefully with all these constants. So when I execute, that command now, I can see plenty of lines being printed out. And at the very top here, I can see that, well, there's a type definition. My TC flag type is really just an unsigned integer or just an int. What we can do now is we can go back to our program and where it says TC flag T, we're just going to put int here and also make it public because all these fields inside the structure need to be public. That's all you need to do. By the same method, you please go ahead, find out what CCT is, what NCCS is. You can find out all of that with just a simple grab. And then I'll finish up the class myself here. Come back in a second. We're just going to compare our stuff. Welcome back. My libc class looks a bit different now and my structs. Please don't freak out. I'm going to take you through it. So when we have a look at our term iOS structure, you can see I condensed all the flags into one line. I found out the type, which was of type byte array slash char array length 19. Hopefully you could grab that yourself. I have an empty constructor. I have a constructor which essentially allows me to copy slash clone a term iOS object. We're going to need that in a second. I have a simple to string method. And most importantly, what I have is a field order annotation. You need to think about in C, everything is just one big memory block. So your struct will occupy one big memory block. You need to tell Jane A what parts of that block correspond to which field here. So first comes the I flag, then the O flag, C flag, L flag. Otherwise, you're going to end up with the wrong values inside those fields. And I just copied the order from the man page again. Then what else do we have? Up here, I put some constants. You could also find in the man page with some additional grepping. And we're going to need them to set our terminal into raw mode in just a second. Just, you know, clone them or copy them from my project, actually, instead of finding them out yourself. And then last but not least, we just have an interface. And the way JNA works is it generates a proxy for that interface at runtime so that whenever you call... Uh, TC get attribute, set attribute, it forwards those calls to the operating system. And for that, you just create, you just call a method native.load, specify the library, the C shared library that's available on Unix, macOS, Linux, not on Windows, so this line will actually fail. You call this method, create an instance out of your interface, and we can use this instance now to finally query our operating system. Let's do it. What we want to do is, before we start with our wild true loop, let's go libc instance and start with getting attributes. I'm just going to put in my constants here. Don't worry about all these specific tiny constants for now. Just, you know, follow along. And we're going to do two things. First of all, we're just going to put an object, an empty object inside the call. And then actually the object will be filled when calling the method. Out here, I get a return code. And if the return code is not zero, then I know there was a problem. We're going to do a system exit one or a system exit return code rather. And we can do a printout, an error message. There was a problem calling tc get attribute, something like that, right? 
And then the only thing what we do is we're just going to print out our term iOS object because I only want to find out if this code actually worked, if we can make native calls. Back in our terminal, Java viewer dot Java. This will obviously fail because we need to reference our jar file, right? So do a class path dash CP, then specify the JNA library like so, and then viewer.java. Let's call it like that. And you can see, yes, we got some nice little output. We got some funky values for those flags back. And now the next question is, how do we enable raw mode? Well, you already know that our term iOS structure doesn't have any methods. And there's unfortunately no easy method to just say set raw mode and, you know, supply the term iOS instance. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste in some code here, right? I'm just going to fix it up a tiny bit. What you need to do is on these fields, the L flag, the I flag, the O flag, what you need to do is you need to do some bitwise ends. This is quite funky, but in fact, what you need to do is you need to bitwise end these fields, L flag, for example, with the negated values of you want to turn off echoing. So you put the echo flag that and negated value. You don't want to have line by line input. That's a canonical mode. So you need to put the I canon flag there. And then also other flags, I extend, I sick, and whatever. You can, by the way, find out what all these flags do again in the man page. But essentially what you need to do is you need to set all these fields here to enable raw mode. We'll talk about vmin, vtime later on again. For now, what I wanted to do is I just want you to copy and paste this code here, right? Down here, we're setting these values. And this should hopefully, this big block here should hopefully enable raw mode. Let's try it out on the command line. Ready? Let's try it out. What you can see as well, I can still see my flags being printed out here. And then I start pressing buttons and yes, I get immediate feedback here. It looks a bit funky, but I don't have to write, you know, line by line stuff anymore and hit enter. In fact, as soon as I press the key, I see the key being printed out. I don't have any echo from the terminal anymore. And by the way, I have another new problem. When I now press control C to send an interrupt to my program to exit, I can see the stuff is being printed out actually. So there seems to be a question mark we'll have to worry about that later the number three will also figure out what that means but in fact my program doesn't exit anymore that's right what we now need to do is being in full raw mode actually even control c doesn't stop our program anymore we need to fix that so let's get back to our program and clean things up a tiny bit first of all what we need to do is we need to we stop printing out the stuff here then we're going to call all of this enable raw mode like so. I I got that. We're enabling raw mode like so. Then we're going to check out if the key that we're reading in, if the key equals for now Q, then we're also going to exit our program. System exit zero. Then it's a nice little exit. That's all we want to need to do. Otherwise, we're just going to go system out print on the key. What else? Yes, let's fix the input a bit and do a carriage return, right? And a new line at the end after every key press. And I think that looks good so far. Let's see what our program now feels like. All right, so the program is running. And as I can see, yes, that looks good. I get immediate feedback. I get no more echoing and everything works just like expected. Or does it? Well, I'm going to exit the program by pressing Q. And now I can see I'm still typing. You can't see it on the screen because echoing is still off. Line by line mode is still off. My terminal is still in raw mode because it just remembers, you know, that I put it into raw mode, which is kind of a problem. What you can do is you can type reset even though you don't see it. And now, you know, everything is back to normal. But in fact, we need to fix up our program a tiny bit. So what we want to do is we want to store these term iOS attributes somewhere and then set them back again when we exit our program. So what I'm going to do is original attributes equals new or rather libc term iOS of, right? We're just going to create a copy like so. We're going to create the field original attributes. We're, we're making that call, right? And I'm just going to 
save them here. And then at the very end, when we exit our program, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to call the very same method down here, inside here. Just this time, please set the original attributes back. And this is hopefully all we need to do. Let's check it out. Right, program is running. I'm typing, I'm hitting Q. Yes, and my terminal is back to normal. That is pretty cool. That was a long, long section on the term iOS library, but that was the second most important point. Calling native functions in addition to the NZ escape codes that you saw earlier allow us to do everything we need to do to now build our text viewer, finally. All right, let's bring everything together and continue writing our text viewer. What I did is I refactored our code a tiny bit. I introduced some meaningful method names. So read key for now just wraps the system in read call. Handle key, which wraps our key press, our Q key press. And we're going to add many more keys in here uh, later on. But we need one more method, the most important method for now, which is the refresh screen method. Refresh screen essentially refreshes or repaints the screen, which means as long as the while loop runs, we re repaint the screen, we handle the key press, and then we do that over and over and over again. What could refreshing the screen look like? Well, we need our NZ escape codes from up here. So I'm just going to paste this one in here, not with a printer then, just a print, which erases the entire screen. Then I want to reposition my mouse cursor, not my mouse cursor, my cursor in the top left corner. This is what this line should do. And then imagine I want to print out a couple of tilts for every row I have, just similar to Vim. Every empty row has the tilt character. So I'm going to go for I less than rows, system out print. And we're just going to put the tilt character here, carriage return, new line. Rows, by the way, I'm just, you know, fake them to 10 rows at the moment. And I guess we're also going to have columns later on. So I'm just going to put that here again. Let's say we're going to have 10 columns now. We need to worry about that in a second. So we're going to print that out now. And what else do we have? A status bar. Then what that means is we're just actually going to do rows minus one to leave some space for our status bar. And we're just going to print out, what do we print out? We're just going to go with Marco code editor version 0.0.1. .0 we're going to have to make it look nicer. So escape code 7M. What does 7M mean? Let me know. 0M at the end to reset the font styling, and that should be it. Let's try out what this code actually does on the command line. Look at that. That looks already quite cool. So we have a couple of tilde signs, obviously just 10 of them. We don't know how many rows we have. We have our status bar. The 7M means invert the color. So instead of white color on black background, use black color on white background, and that already looks pretty cool. But the thing is, we're missing a couple of columns here because we don't know yet how many columns we have and we would need to pad our status message to have a proper status bar. But so far that is quite promising. When I exit the program, oh no, then we can actually see that we still have our stuff left here, which means again, when we exit the program, we need to clear the screen and reposition our mouse cursor. Let's just quickly do that as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy and paste those two lines and put them down here. We can still refactor all of this stuff later on. Now, as for the padding of our status message, let's see how we could do that. Let me just extract the status message, right? And then I know that after, right after the status message, what we need to do is we need to have a couple of white spaces. So I'm going to go white space repeat columns minus status message dot length. So essentially the difference between the status message length and uh, the columns in the screen. And by the way, because this could now be negative, we're just having it hard coded to 10. I'm going to do a math max zero. So if it's negative, I'm not going to pad the string. I'm just going to add zero white spaces to the message. This should work. We're going to find out in a second, once we think about how we can get the actual number of rows and columns of our terminal window. 
And as you might have guessed correctly, it has to do with yet another system call, the last one for this video. We're going to take a quick shortcut because I know already that you need to call a function called IOCTL. Again, if you were to Google or Stack Overflow and ask for how would I get the real number of rows and uh, columns in a terminal window, people will tell you just call the IOCTL function. Try making this function work yourself. So again, just copy and paste the code, read the man page, add the structure objects that you need, and then come back in a second and compare it with the code you're about to see from me. All right, so here we go. What I did is I just copied back the method from the man page. It needs a new struct, the win size struct. As you can see, when I scroll up here, I just put it here, very similar to uh, how we created the term iOS structure before that. You can see there's four fields. I just want two of them, row and cull. These should have my, the number of rows, the number of columns that my terminal window has. And I also created a nice little helper function, get window size, right? where I just, you know, call the IOCTL method, put in the win size struct with this funky, by the way, this is the trickiest problem with calling the IOCTL function. You need to put in this funky constant here to get the right uh, window sizes effectively. But other than that, just copy and paste my code from my GitHub repository and you'll be able to call get window size. Now, when do we do that? Uh, for now, we're just going to do it once at the beginning. We're going to have a method init editor right like so because we have to worry about resizing a bit later on so we do dynamic resizing of the window and repaint it then for now we'll, let's just get the window size once here at the very beginning window size and we're going to set the columns to window size dot ws call and we set the rows to something like that and this should actually work. Let's double check our code again. Rows minus one, columns minus status message. Let's fire up our program again. Ready? Here we go. Look at that. That already looks quite cool. So what we have is now the tilts go down all the way. The same, by the way, with our status message here. The problem is that our cursor is now in the lower right corner, which means we need to reposition our cursor again. And by the way, once I start, you know, pressing buttons, I see pretty heavy flickering. Let's fix these two things now. Flickering plus mouse positioning. Mouse positioning is simple. After we draw the entire screen, we just reposition our mouse. The second thing is the flickering comes from mainly that we call system our print a couple of times, right? All the time here, we just want to call it once with a pre-constructed string. So what we're going to do is we're going to go string builder builder equals new string builder, like so. At the very end, we're just going to print out the string builder, like so. And all the calls in between to system out print, system out print, should be replaced with builder.append. And then I can even get, right, I can make IntelliJ replace everything like that to make it even more performant, something like this. Let's give that a final try. Last time for today, look at that. The flickering is gone even when I heavily press my arrow keys. You have to believe me that I'm doing that right now. Effectively, that's the best skeleton we could put up in roughly half an hour to now continue with our text editor in the next episode. Now that we're at the end of this episode, what comes next? Well, up next, we're going to add real text file loading. So I want to be able to see real text files in here, not just an empty file. And I want to be able to move my cursor around, meaning I want to be able to page and scroll through the file, jump to the end of a line, to the beginning of a line, that kind of stuff. Sounds exciting? It really is. All right, folks, that's it. If you liked the episode, or even if not, please let me know in the comments below. And if you want to see more, please subscribe to the channel. Other than that, sayonara.